All right, welcome everybody. This is our second series on cattle production virtual talks. We've got some more lined up for you and we'll get information out about those soon. The um, speaker tonight is gonna to be Dr. Ralph Noble, the Dean of the College of Ag, Family Sciences and Technology at Fort Valley State University. And um, this was a, a requested topic, um, sire selection specifically with some EB, EPD information um, to be provided for help with selection is you can use this information for selecting for AI or natural service. So Dr. Noble. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for showing up today. What I wanted to try to, to address is, as we move forward, looking at some new marketing opportunities, a lot of times when you look at the market operation, when you're selling animals on individuals one by one, you really get the lowest price. When you can sell animals in clusters, they may call them lots. When you can have a large number of animals that look very similar to each other, they tend to offer you a little bit better price. And so as we move forward with this group between AgriUnity and the associated uh, friends in the community, we want to see what can we start doing to see like, if we could pick I'm gonna say similar bulls. Now, normally a bull can breed up to 25 cows on the farm. And you can see where he's gonna have the influence on 25 calves. If you got a good cow, she's gonna help out one calf. If you get a good bull, he can help out 25 calves. On the contrary, it also says if I get a poor bull and he breed my 25 cows, he's gonna hurt 25 calves. So sometime, rule of thumb, people would spend as much as the price of three cows to buy one bull. Because the bull is going to be around, maybe we're going to say three to four calf crops because we don't want to breed his daughters, you know, to his daughters. So going to the next slide, I want to get similar to some understanding of some language, which is this going to be a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what this says is when it comes to a hamburger or a steak, these are the different segments of the beef industry where people have a focus responsibility, they have targeted goals, and they all play a role in the price of beef. And so the way it starts out is the people that have bulls that breed cows and they sell the babies, that's called cow calf operations. They're gonna sell those calves somewhere between 400 to 650 pounds, depending on the age and how long you keep it. They'll go to a stockyard and a person will come there who will buy them who's gonna be either a feeder or a stocker grower. He's gonna take, now this, now the cow calves gonna to have to do with fertility, the size of the calves, milk production, pregnancy checking, and those type of things. Weaning, castrating the calves, vaccinating the cows and the calves. But the feeder stock is gonna buy them calves around, when they leave that cow calf producer, they can be anywhere from 400, in some cases, pretty good sized calves, 750 pounds, that's where he's growing them to. When they get to 750 pounds, He's taking that group to another stockyard. And a person's gonna buy them that's called finishing or feedlots. He's gonna carry them from about 750 pounds up to what we call slaughter weight, somewhere around 1,300 pounds. When it, and that's what you call finished. So finished means they're gonna to start to lay down fat on their body. They no longer will put on muscle. They no longer will put on much frame. And that's when they target the time to, to process them. If you continue to feed them beyond that weight or age, they'll really put on a lot of fat and fat is really waste. So we wanna put on meat that may cost you, you may get back three to $4 a pound rather than fat that may be 25 cents a gallon. So when it's time the animals start putting on fat, it's time to harvest them. So they'll go to another stockyard, okay? And the person who runs a meat packing business will take over from there. Now he's not gonna do, he's gonna be the one that's gonna inspect them live uh, you may have a veterinarian there, an inspector. Uh, they will do the killing, the processing of them, uh, open up the, the organs, remove the head and the, and the organs inside, and then cut up what's called a carcass. So he's got to get rid of the blood, the organs, and the guts, and then he's going to sell those carcasses. They can change hands to another person who's considered a wholesaler. They would buy that carcass and do what we call fabricate or cut it into wholesale cuts. So the shoulder and the chuck, the hind leg and the sirloin, the, the uh, filet mignon, the, the loin down the back, the ribs, the brisket, he will cut all those up. 
and then he would sell them to another potential person called a retailer who would take those retail cuts, steaks, hamburgers, and package them to sell to the consumer who's the end person there. So you can see when we grow in these calves, they may not do, they may not make everybody along this area happy. That's about 60 breeds of beef cow in America. I think we use probably the top five the most. And so there's no one breed of animal that does the most for everybody. But depending on where you're selling it, they may tell you what's most valuable to them. So let's kind of talk to it as we go. So this is what the commercial market is looking for. We call it box beef. They want that animal, and they're looking at a calf possibly, to be thick muscle. They give a muscle score of one to three. One is too heavy muscle, like it's double muscle. And three is like a dairy cow. So the animals bringing the best price are about a 1.5 muscle score, okay? They also look at how tall it is, frame score. That's another topic we can do at our field days. And these numbers go from one to nine. One, two, and three is considered short. Five, six, and set, four, five, and six are considered medium. And seven, eight, and nine is considered large frame. And right now the market, the market is targeting five to six frame. When you sell a three frame animal or a two frame animal, you can sell it, but the price is gonna be reduced. You sell these big horses for cows, frame score eight and nine, you can sell them, but they're gonna dock that price again. So they're looking for a happy medium. They want to be able to go to, we want to be able to go to Longhorn Steakhouse, buy a one-inch T-bone. I like it so much, I come back next week. I'm bringing my friends. I want to get the T-bone that looks just like the same. I don't want them big and little based on the size of the animal. So here we're talking about a happy medium. The more you can produce a calf that fits what they want, the better the price you can get. When you don't care what you're selling, they don't care what they give you. They want that animal to be processed, butchered, somewhere around 1,300 pounds, and this number is growing, somewhere, somewhere between 1,200 and 1,400 pounds, they call that the slaughter weight. He's starting to pick down fat, peripheral fat. He's putting on all the marble he's going to pick down. Marble is the muscle, the fat in the muscle, and that's when they want to target slaughtering that animal. Okay, that's what they do ideally. When they get through eviscerating, removing the lower legs, the tail, and the head, they want somewhere between the 650 and a 750 pound carcass. The bigger the animal, the bigger this number, the better the quality, the higher the percent. Beef cattle lose around 65% dress percentage, so it can vary a little bit. When they grade that animal and they cut it right down the middle, they come between the 12th and 13th rib and do what's called quartering. And they look at the rear by muscle, the muscle right down the back, the mignon, longissimus dorsi, and they grade the whole animal by that one little muscle right there. They want that muscle to be about a 12 inch ribeye. They don't want no big giant 15 inch ribeyes fit on a dinner plate. And they don't want nothing six inches that may fit on a coffee cup. They want them to fit a certain size. And then when they grade the animal, we're gonna call it quality grades. There's about nine quality grades. The top one is considered prime. The next is called choice. The next is called select. And I'm just gonna say the others. You only cut steaks out of these. When they don't make this grade of meat, it all goes to hamburger meat. So cutters and canners, that's where you put hot dogs, bologna, tea, not, no, no, no uh, soups. Hot, that's where that goes. So the animal could be the same size, but the one that's going for choice may bring you $3 a, a pound. This one here may bring you something like $1.25 a pound, only because of the way it was graded. And that needs to be learned as we look forward going down the road. So another thing we need to be sensitive to is we should all be on some type of similar management plan. We need to have a record of what we're doing, identify the animals, how well they're doing, who are their parents, be sensitive to a herd health program, what disease we want to prevent, what parasites we want to control, and what season of the year, a nutritional program, how much land do I have, how long is my grazing season, how much hay do I need per animal to store? Get a sense of that. And we ain't bought no animals yet. Get prepared for breeding them. So when I want to have my breeding season, and with the with pregnancy being the same, I should be able to predict when they're going to calve. And then have a sense of how many bulls do I need?
for the cows that I have, bull power. So we think about number about one bull for 25 cows or somewhere in that area. At the end of the year, we're going to do like we do our taxes. We're going to select those that did well to stay. And those that didn't, they go to hamburger meat. We can always eat all of them, but only a few of them going to make us money. And we want to pick the ones that's going to stay based on, I say, the top third of the herd. How fast the calf is growing, how well the, the weaning weight of that calf is for the age, and then she reproduced as often as she started out fertility. Those are the traits we want to be able to say. Every year I'm getting better and better. I'm expecting gas prices to go up. I'm expecting feed prices to go up. You must push your cattle to do better too. So this comes to the bull selection. And we're saying basically, select a bull when made it to your cows, produce calves to fit your market. So you must know your cows first. Know what the market's looking for. And can I find me a bull who has the capabilities of making my calf look better than the mom looks? There's a number of ways of doing this. And we've been looking around, and and in a few others, at what we call performance-tested sales. Where animals close to yearlings are placed in a, 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 a similar site, same environment, same feed, and same health, herd health. And they really should measure how fast they grow. At the end of sometime about 120 days, the bulls all come up, they measure it, and you have an auction sale. We've been visiting bulls that way. One thing I want us to be as, as sensitive to is a new way of selecting bulls other than just how it looks. We're looking at some genetic capabilities, and we call this EPDs. These are expected, expected progeny difference. Progeny is your offspring. And we're going to look at EPDs to say, what do you expect his babies to look like compared to other bulls in the same breed? Now, I'm going to look at Angus for right now, okay? And so there's different traits you can look at, EPDs. But we're going to look at those that's going to make us money. So one thing that's important is how big the calves are. Nobody really wants to pull any calves. So we want to look at the EPDs of that bull. This is the only number we want to see close to zero being average. The closer it is to zero, that means it's average for that breed. And then when it gets to be plus five, that's going to be a big care for that breed. The next important trait is weaning weights and milk. And this is what we've been looking at when we've been traveling. We want bulls that have at least an EPD for weaning weight of 60 pounds heavier than the average, in this case, Angus bull with similar calves. And we want to see the, the daughters, if we keep them, those babies will grow faster because she's making enough milk to put on 20 more pounds. So I can keep her heifers, okay? When I'm looking at EPDs, the only thing I want to see small is going to be birth weight. Everything else I want as big as I can get it compared to that breed. Now, we're only talking about one breed. So it says that when I'm looking at weaning weights and the EPD of a bull is 60 pounds, that means that the same age and weight, this bull's babies will be 60 pounds heavier at weaning weight or about seven months or 205 days. Okay, 60 pounds heavier. If he's a, if he's a zero at, at, at weaning weight, he's just average. But I'm trying to get something that's going to make my farm do better. Now, remember, this weight is partially due to the bull's genetics and partially due to how much milk mom is making. And so we've been trying to pick bulls that have a plus 20, handy on EPDs for milk. And that's just on the calf growing. If we want to keep some of the heifers, I need to look at EPDs on milk, and we're going to see an example down the road. And then the final thing we look at is the average weaning weight. So we've been going after bulls on Angus that are zero on EPD for birth, at least plus 60 pounds for weaning weight, and plus 100 pounds for yielding weight, or 365 days. Which means that this bull's babies, compared to other Angus bulls in the breed, and this is at 365 days, they'll weigh 100 pounds heavier. Now, the more you want, you know the more you got spent for that bull. They don't come cheap, and they're not easy, okay? So these are some other traits we look for. Birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight. Frame score, you don't always see it measured. But we don't want any short bulls. Frame score one to three, and we don't want them too big. And we'll probably have another workshop talking about factors influence care prices. These prices are docked. 
and these prices are dot. So we want a bull that's going to be this case like this. That's what the big price is. Sometimes it's influenced by the breed. I'm going to show you a few minutes. The difference between English breeds, exotic breeds, and U.S. breeds. Angus and Herefords are considered English. Charlet, Simmental, and Limousines are considered exotic. And Brangus are considered U.S. breeds. They all have different traits. And when they're being sold at the stockyard or the market, they'll make an assumption that they're going to predict something about those traits. And the other thing they look at when you look at the market report, what they call muscle score. Muscle score goes from one to three. One is heavy muscle. And some of that means they don't grade well. And three is flat muscle, like a dairy cow. So one way you can get performance tested animals, you want some information, you pay for information. And the University of Georgia has these central test stations. Where typically they bring in bulls, sires, from different farms around the state. They put them on the same diet. They get the same vaccinations. They get the same treatment. And the assumption is, the only reason they're going to be different is because of their genes. They get the same, for everything else is the same. At the end of that, say, 120 days, they go up for sale. So Clemson, every state in the country, I think, has one. Normally, the, the land-grant school for the PWI is normally the one who hosts that event. So for us, it's, it's UGA, University of Florida in Florida, uh, Clemson in South Carolina, and Auburn in, in uh, Alabama. So UGA has two bull tests, Calhoun and Tifton. And they're also looking at a heifer development program for the females. But everyone has a bull test sale, all right? When the bulls are going to be purchased, what also determines their value is, are they ready to do any breeding? And a veterinarian would do an examination called a breeding sounds exam, a BSC. They do a physical, breathing, be sure you're not wheezing like I am, uh, get a sense of a semen ejaculate, be sure his sperms are looking pretty good in terms of moving forward. Confirmation is right. And measure his scrotal circumference. It's a way of subjective getting a sense of how much sperm can ejaculate. Meaning that we want a bull to produce enough sperm to breed 25 cows. We're going to say in 30 days. So he must be able to replenish that. If his scrotal circumference is too small, they, sometimes they cash him and they won't sell him at that sale because he can't be guaranteed to be fertile. Sometimes breeds that mature fast like Angus, they get there faster. Some breeds that are real big, Simmental, Charlets, and Limousines, they get there slower. So sometimes you can't compare them at the same time. They take a sample of semen from those animals from different ways, and they look at the sperms under the microscope to get a sense of how well they are. So they'll look at the volume, how much he's ejaculating, what's the concentration, about a billion per meal, you hope, and how many will he ejaculate, about five billion. They'll take a sample in the microscope, what percent are alive, what percent are moving forward, and, and which ones are going to be uh, mature enough to be ejaculated by the bull. So different breeds have different traits. And that's what I want to look at as we talk about these mixed crossbreds. There's a classification of breeds called English breeds. They're the oldest breeds in America. None, no, no cattle was born in America. We have buffalo here. These are all brought in by the, the uh, early folks. So this is mostly Angus and Herford breeds. Let me target Angus. They're known for having a small birth weight, poles so they don't have horns, no need to dehorn them. They're medium frame now, they're getting bigger, but they also can be small. Most Everybody don't have no small frame animals. A Angus can, but they're known for the most part for high carcass quality. That's that prime choice and select animal. When people see black in it, they think it is carcass quality. So they're going to judge an animal by the color. If it looks black, they'll soon the meat going to grade higher and they're going to pay a better price for that. Another thing about this animal, because it's kind of small, small to feed the frame, they mature fast. They go to that bull quick. And I have seen bulls breed his daughters while she's still nursing. So it means that we have to separate them daughters. Don't leave them in that, that bull too long. You'll be having some early pregnancies. Now, these are the ones that make calves grow. The exotic or continental breeds. Simmental, Charlotte, limousines. That's what these breeds are. The known for having a large birth weight. More of a large, we're going to say medium to large frame, but they grow like the Dickens. Okay? They're born big and they grow fast. So they're known, if you can tell by this down here, they're very lean. They don't grade very well, but they give you high carcass quantity. 
I want a big carcass. I got small animals giving me a carcass that's maybe 600 pounds. I want to get it bigger. I looked at some of these breeds to give me carcass quantity. But they're also slow maturing. They may not be ready to breed as fast as the Angus and Herefords. Okay? They take a little bit longer. And they may not reproduce as fast after they had their calf. So the English breeds breed quickly. These breeds breed slowly. So we're talking about taking these animals and making them better. You look at that Sim Angus. They want to take an animal that's real big, reduce the birth weight, reduce the size, pit up with not growing as fast, but really make it mature quicker. So that's why that Sim Angus has gotten so popular. The key is we got to be careful having too much Simitol in it. We want the Sim Angus to be, I'd like to see three-fourths Simitol, three-fourths Angus and a quarter Simitol black. They're the ones that's giving you those good traits. We saw some good ones coming in the other day. These are breeds you see in the Southeast, US or American breeds. These are breeds that are crossed with Brahmin cattle. This is the Brahmin here. I'll come back to that one. And they are breeds that they took and crossed with the existing American breeds. Angus was here. We mixed with Brahmin to get Brangus. Beefmaster, this one here, we mixed with Angus and Hereford with Brahmin. They got Beefmaster. And a Bradford is a cross between a Brahmin and a Hereford. Normally, we want as little of the Brahmin as we can get in it, which is three eighths. And I want five eighths of the other breed. Five eighth Angus, five eighth Hereford. I only want enough Brahmin in it to give me certain traits that have to deal with the environment heat tolerant, disease and parasite resistance. They may be slow maturing, but when you cross them with other breeds, they get a performance called hybrid vigor that's fantastic. But the characteristics they get would vary with what they cross them with. Okay? And you normally see like a long sheath on them. You may see heavy ears. That means they got some brown in them. But when these cows go up to the north, to the Midwest, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Nebraska, where it's cold, they don't do too good up there. So when animals are being purchased from the stockyards here, and you see a calf showing any brown in it, influence, they're Dr. Price because they know it won't do well in the Midwest. If they're going to a feline in Texas, okay. Going to Louisiana, okay. They're going to Florida, okay. Nebraska, no. North Dakota, uh, when the rest of the animals are staying warm and growing, they're burning up food trying to stay warm. They're not putting no weight on. Everybody's putting on two and three pounds a day. They're putting on one pound a day, half a pound a day, because they're burning up so much food to stay warm. So they get docked when they go into the pack, when they go to the stockyards, when they see what we call ear on them. And this is the one you don't see much of unless you're in deep Florida, hot tropical areas. They come from India and Africa. Heat tolerant, handle the heat. They develop from areas where they don't, parasite, they don't treat them. They don't spray them for flies. They need a lot of shade. And they make it. And then the ones that come out of there. We brought some to America. So that heat tolerant, that's that breed portion that comes from them, those American breeds. They can handle without being dewormed in some cases. And they can fight off certain diseases. But sometimes when we keep them too long, they tend to lose that trait. Hybrid vigor from crossing them. They, the babies grow real fast. They're resilient. When tough climates come around, they eat the leaves. Sometimes bark off a tree. But the behavior can be rough. They can tear up stuff. And they don't do well in the cold climate. And if left alone, they're not known they have the best carcass traits. So if you just want something to eat, you can get it from this animal. But if you want to do better than, say, Angus, you better find another way to get there. So one other way to get a good bull is through artificial insemination. And that topic will require another seminar all by itself. And this is where we're going to take sperm from those males and pin them into a female organ by our, by our manipulation. Human is going to harvest sperm from the male, pin them in the female at the right time, and she should get pregnant from that. The difference here is that we can get sperm from bulls that we normally cannot afford to buy. We've been getting bulls, $50,000 bulls, Get his friends for $20. So you can get bulls, superior genetics from animals. You cannot afford to buy the animal, but I can get his babies in Georgia. And you can anticipate buying some of the best ones in terms of performance. I can look at pedigrees to know who's, who's historically done real well. And if I know one fit the, fit the market right, I can influence what I sell, what price I get for what I'm selling based on the bulls. So one thing about AI and cows, it does require that we have to watch the cows twice a day. 
And when, you, when they come up in what they call standing heat, they allow another male or female to mount them and they won't move. That's the time we put sperms inside of her. And normally you want to watch them, I want to say before nine and after three. So we're going to check them in the morning, check them in the afternoon. If a cow is in heat, you must go separate that cow and restrain her. We're going to take the sperms which have been thawed about 450 degrees. We're going to thaw it out in a semen tank about 95 degrees Fahrenheit for about 45 seconds. We're going to load it to what's called a French gun and then use that human's will to insert that semen into the female. And that's probably where you get your money being made there. You're trying to deposit the semen up into the body of the uterus of the female, not just in the vagina where the bull would do. But in this case, we're talking about taking a bull. They can normally be 25, 40 cows a year. To say the average bull in America, I think, lives five years. So we're talking about maybe 500 babies. With AI, we got bulls with 10,000, 50,000 babies. So AI means I'm not worried about disease spread. I'm not worried about the bull can't get around, put him on a trailer, take him somewhere I can have his babies. We can get him in Florida, Alabama, and Georgia at the same time without shipping him around. So what's some of the advantages of AI? You limit the cost of owning the bull. You just got a semen tank there. You can use outstanding expensive bulls, as I mentioned, the price at a fraction of the cost. But to be successful, you need to have bulls and cows that's in good health. And you can increase the use of various breeds. I can almost match a bull. If I got 25 cows, I really could even, I really could breed them with 25 different bulls with AI. But if I'm buying a bull, I'm probably gonna let them breed all those cows together. And because we know who's bred to who. We should do better with our record keeping. What are some of the problems? It takes some skills to know how to put that sperms in those females. And that's what's really the short supply. We're going to be trying to nick it. I'm going to be trying to work with some students to get them skilled. But they can have these jobs in the community doing these kind of things. Sometimes farmers are used to having that bull in the field. They're not used to going and doing heat detection twice a day. They may not even be around their farm at times. That, that's, that may not be for you. And if your cows are not properly managed, you can spend all that money getting them made it, but you get a low pregnancy rate. But normally you should not expect a pregnancy rate no higher than what that bull would do after one time. So typically speaking, I would say 50% if you AI one time and put a bull behind them. Don't get rid of your bulls. Until you get yourself doing real well, have the bull that will come behind the AI, we call the cleanup bull. I would say a week or two after, the bull, after you stop, and at the same time, when you AI the cows, wait about a week or two. So we want to know who the baby is, who the father is to the bull, and let them go. Okay? So you must be separate and restrain the cows for AI. You, so you're doing some work now. And if you don't have that time, AI would take your money. What would it cost you to AI cows? The semen can vary. They tell me between $12 and $15 a straw. We try to buy straws close to $20 for the above average. You must have an AI kit. Cost about $250. A person may travel, may have to charge you mileage. That may change with the gas price. And he may charge you what I'm going to do to AI the cows. So you can see we'll be probably getting close to $50. And if this semen not going to make that calf be worth $50, don't buy that semen. AI doesn't make the bull real good. So if you're not picking that bull right, you're going to get some calves that ain't going to be worth your money. What's going to be the outcomes that we can look at this down the road? We can get a large quantity and quality of bulls at the same time. We can anticipate a better quality calf. And if we know how to market it for this reason, we should get improved price of calves. If you do enough cows, the price per cow bread should be cheaper compared to trying to do five. And now if the cows, the calves look uniform, they got the same father. We, we breed in five different farms. Everybody got 25 cows. We can breed them to the same bull because we got all about that semen. We can look at a different market option. I'm going to leave that alone. One thing that may come into place about breeding those cows is that cows can be in heat any time over a 21-day period. Because of that reason, you got to go watch them. Another thing you could do is an option is called estrus synchronization. We can give her like, it's not a birth control pill. We can give her some medication to control, control when she shows heat. So this treatment may go anywhere from seven to 14 days. After you stop the treatment, all the all these cows, 25 to 100, can be in heat within 23 days after you stop the treatment, okay? So you don't wanna have 100 cows in heat at the same time. 
You got to spread that out. But it does require, when that cow is in heat, you bring her up, treat her a couple of times. It may be in the feed. It could be an injection, synchronizer, or intravaginal device that we're going to look at later on. Okay? And then you can either get breed them when they come in the heat or do what's called fixed time. We just pick a time we anticipate to come in the heat and breed them all whether we see it or not. Those are the two ways people have been using AI on cattle. You can reduce the time to heat check, reduce the labor for heat checking twice a day for 21 days by doing it in a weekend. You reduce your breeding season. They're going to be all bred within two or three days. So all the calves should come within two or three days. So you see the benefit of having what we call similar calves. What are some of the reasons to make it hurt, work out real good? When cattle are healthy, when they're well managed, a person who's experienced AI in the cows, and he knows how to handle the semen, okay? Then the farmer or the animals know how to have some handling facilities. You can't go get a rope and drag them into the pen, hit them with a hot shot, get them all stressed out. Then the cows won't get pregnant. Stress hurts reproduction. You want them to be calm walking in there, easy to get in there, breathe them, and they walk right out. When cows are highly stressed, you probably can find another way to get them mated. Uh, handling facilities, you must let those cows wait at least 45 days after the last calf. Have them in pretty good health. We look at what they call body condition scores. Somewhere between borderline, fast six or seven. I mentioned stress scores, about a one to two. And then select the ones that get eight, that, that conceive the AI. They don't conceive, don't bring them up next time. Let them stay with the bull. And they have an experienced technician. So the expected progeny different, EPDs. This is whether you're picking a bull from naturally mating or AI. And it's a difference in the performance of calves of one bull versus calves from other bulls in the same breed. And you can look at things like birth weight, cow calf, weaning weight, cow calf, yielding weight for that feed of stocker, and rear by area of interest to that packer. When the breed of the EPD is a zero, that means it's the only breed average. Anything that's a plus, means it's above the average of that breed. When it's negative, it means he's below the average of that breed. The only thing we want to see negative is the birth weight. Okay? So we consider negative, meaning below average birth weight for calves, that's okay. But it also varies by breed. A zero birth weight for Angus is probably talking about a 65 to 75 pound calf. But a zero birth weight for Simitol is probably 80 to 90 pound calf. So they don't mean the same with the breeds. A zero weaning weight for an Angus is probably like 500 pounds, 205 days. For a Simitol farm, they're going to be more like 600 pounds. So plus 25 for an Angus is 525, plus 25 for a Simitol is plus 625. Another thing we need to watch out for is we try to get these traits in these bulls. Some of these traits are selected uh, associated with performance. This is the way it happens a lot. When they're born little, they grow slow. When they're born big, they grow fast. Also, when they grow real fast, they don't make the most fertility and they don't make the most milk. What do we want for a bull is, it takes some looking, a bull that's born little and grow as fast as the big boys. And when you look at them tracing the EPDs, that's what we're looking for. So the sale we went to the other day, we had 59 bulls. We only picked out 12. They fit this thing right here. Everybody can find a big bull if you got big cows. I don't want nothing they ain't gonna pay for the bull, pay for itself. And the other thing is, can he grow fast and still be fertile, scrotal circumference, and still make enough milk? We looked at plus 20. We had to look around to find that right kind of bull. So there's things we can read in an animal before you actually have any babies to predict these type of things. Okay. Another thing we need to look at is what they call accuracy. Accuracy is how likely are you to get that performance we just talked about with the EPDs. Accuracy is based on the number of calves that they've looked at. And that number can go from 1% to 99%. If it's a young bull, you don't have many calves, 10 to 25% accuracy. Means it may not stay that way. You're taking a guess when you get a young bull. An older bull, five, eight years old, He's got a lot of kids we comparing this data from. He's 80 to 99% accuracy. You can bet your money on this bull here. But you can bet he also costs more money. These are cheap. 
These are expensive. And as you go from here to here, the numbers go smaller and smaller. So the price will increase based on what trade it was that he excels in and what was the performance there. We want the birth rate to stay same. We're making them on our birth rates. But we saw some bulls at that sale, uh, Andy. They were winning their 800 pounds. They were going for eight and $10,000. When they went for 500 pounds, they go for $2,000. So you had to give those away. So that's based on those type of traits. Another thing is to look at is, is what they call trait ratios. How did a group of calves, and, and if the bull test is the same way, or on your farm, how do these calves compare with each other on your farm? So we're comparing our calves on a particular trait. That's the trait. Trait is weaning weights, birth weights, wean, those type of things, okay? And you're comparing cattle with the same management. That's nobody's farm, the same farm. So this is an example of a pedigree. Nikki Whitney gave me this one. And it shows, you know, this is a pedigree. So the top line is the father. This is the mother. This is the paternal father. This is the paternal mother. This is the paternal uh, maternal father. This is maternal mother. So see this boy right here? He just died. He had 75,000 babies when he passed away. His parents were going for 125,000 strong. So you can tell this, he had some, back, some background in him. If you look at his birth date, 1993, he got a lot of calves. So let's look down here. So if you look at this birth weight and accuracy, his birth weight was 1.5 above regular Angus. And look at that accuracy. He was, he's been around a long time. His weaning weight, he was plus 40 pounds. And accuracy of 92%. Yielding weight, plus 71 pounds. So this bull is worth his money. Because I'm sure we're going to get, when I get a young bull, you won't get that accuracy going to be more like 10%, 20%. And you may or may not get what you want. But let's look at another chart here. This is showing when you look at these sale barns, these sales to these places, they measure production off that bull. They may also look at carcass traits. So we always want to look at birth weight. Be mindful that if it's a young bull, this may be small 20%, 10%, that type of thing. But I want to see him born little and then grow fast. Okay? Born little. Now, when we went the other day, we wanted this to be bigger than 60. We want this to be bigger than 100. And we end up getting four or five bulls like that. And so you got to sit around and go to a lot of sales, but you can't find what you want. We also, because eventually we hope to sell these calves for the meat market, we can look at the carcass weight of 11 pounds heavier with good accuracy, the marble, which is the grade of meat, improving, and the rear by area is not. So if you grade it okay, you're not trying to get a bigger carcass by him. I may we'll pit them with some Sim Angus cattle, all right? This is an example of a trait ratio on your farm. And we're going to measure this, what we call our weaning weights. I got all my calves here. I got 10 calves. This is their weights at the same time, 25 day weight, predictably. I'm going to average this weight up of these calves. And for my 10 calves in my farm, they average 625 pounds. I'm now going to compare every calf to 625, okay? When it's when it's 625, it's a 100 ratio. When it's less than 100, they're considered below average. When they're above 100, they're considered above average. And the average is 625. So let's look at the next slide. Let me look at this here. So with the herd, they're looking at weaning weight. I'm going to keep these calves. I'm going to sell them to you if I don't like you. I'm going to keep the ones for myself. Calf one on that chart had a weaning weight of 524. I'm going to compare that to the average of the herd. 625, it comes to about 0.84. To convert to percent, I multiply times 100, it comes to 84%. What does that mean? Compared to 100, he's 16% below herd average. Care number 10 on that page. Care number 10, this one here. Okay. He weighs 742 pounds. I'm going to compare 742 to 625. Okay. I've been 742 over the same average. I come to this number, 100. He comes to 119%. What does that mean? He's 19% above the herd average when it comes to weaning weight. What does that tell me? I go back to this. I'm going to sell these calves because they're below my herd average. I'm going to keep these calves here. And I will find out in due time who's, who's the mother to this cow right here. Cow number one. And she do it again. Mom's getting on the truck too. 
And these down here, if I got any heifers from them, you can't buy them from me because they're the best animals I got. Remember, this is the generation coming up. This is my future. And they're doing better than everybody else with the same boy. They all got the same father. But this boy is doing fantastic. I keep him for sure. You can buy it from me. I mean, I mean, I can tell you I had this one. I may go ahead and take her to the stockyard and get rid of her and the mom. Okay? So we're going to sell the below average animals, below 100%. I'm going to hang on to maybe breed them, sell them as bred heifers, everything over 100. So 6 to 10 was 112, 102 to 119, okay? So in summary, size selection can have a great impact on the herd. One bull will impact 25 cows. We actually have multiple options available to select bulls. Selection today has taken steps to improve predictability, expectations, and results. So we charge, they charge more bulls for them. We're paying more, more money for these bulls now. Understand the EPDs, trait ratios, and accuracy can help with selecting the bulls. And remember, the future of your herd today, the, the future of your herd depends on what you select for today. That's my last slide. Any questions? Hello. Yes. One question. This is Dr. Wilson. Um, if a farmer has a bull and they have no data, yeah. but they want to get some information on their bull, they're looking at possibly selling it or they want to, they don't know whether they're going to keep it to start a new program with them. Should they go ahead and get some of the EPD testing done on that bull, even though they may not know much about the heritage of that bull? And then roughly, what does that cost the farmer to have that done? Yeah, if it's not a registered bull, you really can't get that information. You didn't, you didn't pay for it. Can't do it. Not you get it. So you just okay. make an assumption on if he got his babies already. He's going to judge his bull based on the babies that he see. We may call it progeny testing. You're going to judge the bull based on his babies. If I don't like his babies, the next time I go buy a bull, I'm going to look at a little bit more detail, a little more science to it. And that's what we, we're paying for that for them bulls. They don't come easy. When they're cheap, you raise your own calf, you buy your neighbor's bulls, you're going to end up with stuff you don't know for sure. You got to wait till the mother gets pregnant nine months, the baby don't grow good enough, and so a year, later, a year and a half later, you find it wasn't a good buy. That's too much money to spend. But sometimes, because we don't have much money, that's what we choose to do. But we're trying to look at some ways to do a little bit better going forward. Dr. Wilson, we went to visit a, a farm. They had about 10,000 cows. And they would buy your calves mm -hmm. back if you buy Chantel Farms. Is the herd. And they would look at the pedigree of the bull and make a judgment on the price. If you didn't have a pedigree with EPDs on it, they wouldn't buy the calves. So they're going to give you a bump in mm -hmm. price and the market price. But you got to have information. So if you want to go to the stockyard, which mm -hmm. is the cheapest price, you better keep going there. If you're trying to get more money, <laughs> you got to put more work into it. And that's what we haven't been a part of for a long time. I think that's where we got to start. Yes. Yeah, I just, we talked about this in the past, too. If you just have a few animals and you want to do something like freezer beef or whatever, it might be cheaper to buy calves because of the the time and effort for breeding and having a bull for just a few animals. But I talked to a, I talked to a producer. There's all different kinds of cattle production systems you can get into. And I talked to a guy um, who sold his whole herd to a guy with the, with the agreement that he would buy back the calves. And that's kind of like what Dr. Noble was just saying, is if you use his genetics, he'll buy all the calves back and finish them out. So he said that was more cost effective for him than it, it was to try to deal with calving and buying bulls and that kind of stuff. So different types of I guess, production systems that you can think about. Uh, is there a chart for these numbers, ratios, maybe a printable software, et cetera? I guess that question is Dr. Whitley and Dr. Noble. Is I, there I, you can buy some record keeping computer systems. They can calculate it for you. You know, if you got a big enough herd to justify the cost. But there's formulas that can convert that for you when you insert that in, into the computer system. 
Yeah, I mean, I and I have, I've created in the past Excel spreadsheets, so you can just put the weights in and it would calculate the rest. And I can do that for somebody if they want. I mean, that for for something as simple like these ratios, that's that's not difficult to do. Because sometimes if you had children or kids around the house, it may be something they can do pretty fast on their phone. So these are things once you get, the, the key here is to be able to catch your animals and to weigh them. So record keeping and data. So we're gonna, we're gonna use what we call data-driven decisions. The numbers are gonna tell me what I'm gonna, I'm not gonna keep everything. I don't want this bull, I don't want this KF here number one doing this next year. If she did it, uh, if she was a heifer, okay. If she's seven years old, that's her last time. So we're gonna make decisions based on cows, usually beef cows. Their performance normally goes up to maybe five or six years old. After six, they start to go down. If this cow here is at, if, at six years old, next year's gonna, it's probably gonna be 520. Then in 510, no need keeping her no more. She didn't done you her worth. If it's a heifer and I got three more years, I'm gonna take a chance with her. But get a sense of where these cows are in, this, in the reproductive cycle. If this is a three-year-old, or oh, next year she may be 750. But this one is run her course. And so what I'm gonna do is I, I, I got I only got enough land for 10 cows. If this if this one if number nine or ten has heifers, I'm keeping them, I'm getting rid of one and two. And you can imagine if I average them next year, this won't be in here. That's what we're trying to do. We're gonna use records to tell us what to keep, what to sell, and in some cases, what don't keep the babies from. When I get rid of 84, I'm sorry, when I get rid of uh, kid number one, I may get rid of mom too. I see the traits is not that great. Let her go too. Because she, she may do better or worse, depending on where she is on her, on her reproductive cycle. Let me point out something. These, we, these weights here are adjusted. Yes, that's right. So in order, like Dr. Noble was saying, the age of the mother impacts weaning weight. And so there are adjustment factors that you multiply by, multiply the weaning weight by, and it will allow you to adjust for age of the mother so you're comparing them equally. There's also adjustments for actual day of age. So an adjusted weaning weight is, is adjusted to 205 days, even if you weighed them at 250 days of age, it's gonna adjust it back to that 205 day and it's gonna adjust it for Angus, for example, has an adjustment factor that they give you that you can put, do a formula for age of the dam. So the minimum you would want to adjust it for is their actual age. And you would do that by getting their average daily gain and multiply it by how many days old they are when you weigh them. So that is an adjusted weight and you need to use adjusted weights to, so you can compare fairly because I, I had a I had a colleague once a farmer that I was working with it was also somebody I went to school with and he picked his heifers at weaning and he just run them through a shoot he didn't know who went with who how old they were when they were born and so the biggest one could have been the oldest one and and you know, there may have been one that was younger, but for their age, a lot grew a lot faster than that biggest one. So having those records, like Dr. Noble was saying, keeping those records, know when they're born, taking those weights so that you can compare equally is important. I have a question. Yes, we hear you. Uh, you know, in the springtime, there's normally a, a number of bull sales going on. And I'm in Mississippi, and they normally have a, this is a Beef Improvement Association to have a sale coming up maybe in March. And, our, and they're going to publish a uh, booklet maybe a week or so ahead of time with all of the bulls that's going to be in the sale. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys offer any technical assistance to our farmers who are looking at our, maybe improving their herd by buying the best bull for their, their herd? by maybe looking at that information, making some kind of, you know, suggestions. I know you, you know, want to go online and say buy this bull, but is there some technical system available to help 
interpret those EPD n numbers and and birth weight and all that and what may be best for your for your herd? So, so Dean, I can't speak for you. I think we should be able to look at. We have a lot of guys like Mr. Copeland, a lot of people on here that is real familiar with EPDs. I don't see why we couldn't, if you electronically email us, we can take a look at that information and just kind of give you our suggestions. Um, if you kind of maybe probably want to also give some pictures of it. I, you know, you know, we've been I've been running with on, on weekends with Handy and some of the fellas in Agri Unity. We've been to what five sales, four or five sales. And what normally happens to really help out the most is I go see their cows first. I see their cows first and we figure out what kind of bull will help them. And we go look at the EPDs, pick out maybe 10 bulls. When we get to the sale, we may, we may only really end up with two. So we can, okay. I can look at the EPDs for you. I don't mind that. It'd be as accurate if I don't see your cows. Well, I mean, that's what Handy was saying. If you, you can maybe get some video of your cows, yeah. if somebody, you know, either working them through the shoot so he can get an idea of how big they are or, you know, get some frame score estimates or just with somebody, somebody out there walking in them so you can tell the size of them and you can give him information about where you want to go with that herd, you know, and any of us can, are willing to help you look at EPDs, but we have to know where you want to go with, with that. So... I could do a video of them, you know, uh, even take pictures, you know. Dr. Noble, so what I'm getting out of this is that not only just looking at the data, the EPD data that they have for these sales, whereby you can go in there and you can figure out just looking at the numbers, they meet your criteria, but you're really saying that you really got to see them, you got to touch them, you got to see them and see what they look like uh, to really make that final decision. Is that what I'm gathering from you? That's right. Because one thing about just the weight alone, so we want a bull pit together the right way. So, for example, we can just imagine how he's put together. The muscle down his back is the is what brings the most money. Filet mignon, T-bone, ribeyes. We want that muscle to be very, very long, and I want it real wide across the back. So he's got to be put together that way. We want him big, but the market's part brings the most money. The next most important cut is the rear leg, the sirloin. I want that muscle to be wide. I want it to drop real low on his body. I don't want a real a tight muscle on his rump. I want it to be full. You see it with Charlotte's and limousines. And that's the second most cut, the, the sirloin. And the third biggest cut, I want him wide in the chest. The, the broader the space between his chest, the bigger the truck ropes cut him is. I don't want him there on the front. So I want him long. I want him deep body and wide stands. And if the bull looks like that, he's going to stand those on his babies. When I mess up with those traits, you're going to mess up all my babies. So that's the idea behind So the data is just, to is just totally weight. We want to get to the point that we're trying to talk with the Agri Unity Group. We want to market, we want to market beef. Not the K, I'm marketing the, the animal from it. That's where you get the money from it. Right now, I, I mentioned the cow care. They get the smallest amount of money. Every time that, that chart I show changes hands, it means somebody else is being paid to do that. We want to do that ourselves. Because right now, let's say for hamburgers, I think last year, for every dollar the housewife paid for a hamburger, the farmer got 25 cents. We want to start to get 30 cents, 50 cents. But as long as you sell to the stockyard, you may get 20 cents. We're trying to organize ourselves to say, we want to be able to get 50 cents per dollar invested. But we got to do more work. We can't do the easiest route. And that's what we're trying to do right here. This is kind of confusing May, may be confusing for some people, but Dr. Noble talked about accuracies and young bulls. There, There's data now that's called genomic EPDs. So if there's a G in front of it, basically the genomic EPDs also have, have DNA results tied to the EPDs and that makes them more accurate. So if you're gonna look for a young bull because a lot of times that that those are the ones you're looking at when you're looking at performance tests is looking at those young bulls so the accuracy is going to be lower if you if you select the ones that have genomic data dna data with it that is more accurate also dr noble was saying that if it's not registered then you you can't get the epd data and so in the past we've only been able to compare within a breed. Because like he said, average for a Simmental is way different than average for an Angus. 
Well, Angus cattle, the Angus Association has developed what they call, I think it's adjustment factors, but basically they can take, you can look at the EPDs for a Simmental and take the Angus adjustment factors for those EPDs and basically convert a Simmental EPD to an Angus EPD so that you can see what it would be on your Angus cows. So if anybody's interested in that, let me know. I can help you find that information and explain how to use it. But the Angus Association does have that on their website on how to convert another breed's EPD to Angus so you could use that breed bull on your Angus cows. I think another thing that happens at these performance sales is normally when they bring the bull in the sale, they rank them on these ratios. Whatever makes them money. Now, some breeds are not going to compete as well. Brangus is one of them. So sometimes it's hard to find a Brangus if you put it in with other breeds where he's going to stack up compared to the Simitars and Charlades. I would even say when it comes to Sim Angus and pure Simitars, most of the Simitars can all, most of the time will outgrow Sim Angus, but they won't bring you the value that the Sim Angus will. The Sim Angus will give you carcass quality in addition to carcass quantity. So sometimes buying a pure Simitol, you can, you can deem your market price because of the grade of meat. And so when you're trying to compare Sim, Sim Angus together, it may be a disadvantage to have a three quarter Simitol, a quarter Angus, compared to a Sim Angus that's three quarter Angus and a quarter Simitol. The, the three quarter Angus quarter Simitol is a better value than a three quarter Simitol and a quarter Angus for the market you're trying to hit. So be sensitive to when they say Sim Angus, what's the percent Simitol in it? We don't want no big horses coming out. And that's what the Simitols are doing. And they cut the grade out. The more Simitol, the less they grade. The more Angus, the higher the grade. Dr. Noble, uh, Alfred Greenlee. Uh, what's the, you talked about the black angus and, and the meat of the black angus. Uh, what's the difference in that and the red angus? Well, they're about the same. People just know that when you look at black color, it normally comes from angus. But if it's red, it could be limousine, gale v, it ain't quite all clear. Now, somebody know you're selling, selling red angus cows, it, it's, it's in the same room, it's in the same rim. We just know more about that black angus. So whenever they see black in it, the assumption is it's going to have a better carcass grade because of the black angus in it. But a red angus and black angus can really have similar traits. We've just been selecting black angus longer. So black limousines, black simitals, is everything has been put some black in it. And when they see black in it, the buyer, we're talking about the packing plant, he's assuming when I sell that carcass, the 700 pound carcass, I'm going to get a better price because it's going to grade higher. And that's what angus means. Dr. Noble. Yeah. The black baldy, why why on average at a commercial market they bring higher? Yeah, you can't beat them. It's hard to beat them. The only trouble I would worry about when you have white on the face of some of these animals, Simitol, Herfords, and Charlet, and they go out west, they can have trouble with dusking in the eye, they get pink eye, they get cancer eye, so they get dock. But if you got what they call gargle eyes. Goggles like glasses. If you got pigment around the eyes, you get what's called hybrid vigor. It's when you cross two animals of different breeds and the baby comes up bigger than the mom and dad said it should grow. Let's say, let's say mom, let's say dad says this weaning weight is 500 pounds. Mom says in her day that her baby should be 400 pounds. If I cross an Angus on Angus, the baby will come up 450. I bring an Angus on a Hereford, it may come up 525. So where did that wow. increased growth come from? That's from hybrid vigor. Same thing with those brangus. You put brangus on something that's not related to it, Hereford, uh, other breeds, you get this big jump in, in growth. And some people like them, but they won't go to the meat packing plants in the Midwest like that. Oh, well, if your cats are being sold to somebody who's going to keep them in the South, the hybrid vigor from that Brahma inflow, the brangus, because brangus gives you a better carcass quality than, say, the beef master or the Santa Catrudas. And they got enough Angus in it to improve the carcass, but they can still handle the heat in the, in the South like Mississippi 
in those areas. Uh, uh, Dean Novers, this is uh, Lamar Berry. Uh, can you explain uh, again um, why it is like with Sim Angus, um, some of the cows come out so many different colors? Yeah, if the animal is a, a first generation Sim Angus, now the, the scimitars, when they come from they come from Switzerland, they are red. They don't they never come black. They red. The Americans made them black because they were getting too big in America. So by putting black in it, we make the, the, the frame get smaller. We actually made the muscling get smaller. And we made the, the size of the babies get smaller. Oh, well, they were being hurt because the babies were being born too small. Say 20 years ago. Now they they find this Angus bloodline in them can bring some traits to improve where they're weak and retain some of the, the strength in them. So the Angus is considered a small to medium frame and scimitar are considered medium to large frame. The percent Angus is really what the market is looking for. When they get too much scimitar in them, they give you a good size carcass, but the meat will not likely grade prime or you may find choice. They're going to be more closer to select. And if they don't grade, then they're going to charge you for cutting up a T-bone steak into soup and hamburger meat, that type of stuff. So we got to be careful getting too much scimitar in it. When the animal is half scimitar, half Angus, half that bull sperms to throw red babies, half that bull sperms to throw black babies. When that, when, that, when that half Angus, half scimitar is bred to another Angus, it is now three-quarter Angus and one-quarter scimitar, I will see a scimitar in it every once in a while, a red calf, not many times. If I take that three-quarter scimitar, three-quarter Angus, and a quarter scimitar, and breed it to an Angus again, you can almost never see a red calf come out. So the closer you get to that half and half, the more likely you'll see some of the calves are going to come out red. I don't mind red coming up every now and then in my cows, but I don't want horns. And one of the, cause if you have horns in your calves in order to get them ready for the feedlot, you you have to disbud them or dehorn them. And so that's, you know, that's, you're gonna get docked for horns and you get docked or less money for red usually. Like Dr. Noble was saying, we have created black simmental. So you can actually buy a simmental that is double black, so it, it wouldn't throw any reds. That's called homozygous black. And so you can buy those. If you wanna have all black calves, then you can use a black Angus bull because they are all homozygous black, or you can use a homozygous black Sim Angus. So, and you want that double polled when you're looking at Simmental, unless you have all Angus cows, because all Angus are all double polled. Angus never have horns if they're pure Angus. So that's why you sometimes get the red is because like Dr. Noble said, there's a red gene floating around in, in a lot of the Simmental. Where, where do I look? Uh, is is it on the EPDs uh, anywhere? On the pedigree uh, above, the, up would identify him. If they ran the test, it would be on the pedigree. You can also have them tested. There, there's genes for that that you submit the DNA and they tell you if they're homozygous or not. So if the person selling him had him tested, it should be on the pedigree. And normally they're put it on the pedigree when he's homozygous or either double pole or double black. If it doesn't say it, he's most likely not it. Remember now, when he's double pole, he shouldn't throw no calves with horns, because scimitar have horns. If he's double black, he shouldn't throw no red calves. If I'm going to guarantee it, I put it on the pedigree. It's worth more money. If, you, if I can't guarantee it, it won't be on there. So if your pedigree does not say it, it means he's, he can throw some red calves. So up where they put his, his registration number, his ID number, and I've seen it in catalogs. When they sell them at these performance sales, you mentioned like the one in Mississippi, they'll tell you because uh, Brangus are the same way. Brangus, you know, they got that Brangus and that Brahma in them. They can sometimes throw gray calves. 
if it's a half blood. Half Brangus, I mean half Brahma, half Angus. When they get three eighths, five eighths, they they what they do, they call it breed true. Every catch should look like a Brangus. But early on, when they half and half before they get to three eighths, five eighths, you can throw some calves that don't look like a Brangus. They either carry the gene from mom, which is more Brahma, or they carry more gene from dad, which is in this case more Angus. But the anything that's you know, those are what they call hybrids. They ne- they don't really call them crossbreds. We call them hybrid because they should breed true. Everything should look like the parents. But if you had all Angus, if you had Angus Herford black baldies, they don't always breed true. You may get a gene from the black side or the red side. But when they're purebred, as compared to full blooded, full blooded animals come from that country. Purebred, we got them into this country. We, we had a question in the chat box about how to begin the process of keeping records and collecting information. And one of the things that I recommended in the chat box was um, making sure you tag or identify somehow your cows and calves so you can match them up and you can know what calf belongs to what cow. So you can see what that cow is doing and you can see what those calves are doing. So especially if you're gonna be doing any, you're gonna AI to different bulls or you're gonna do AI and a cleanup bull, those kind of things, you'll wanna know how those, how those sires are doing by being able to identify their calves. And you have to be able to identify what calf goes to what cow if you're looking at birthdays. So you may know that cow calved on X date, but if, but you need to be able to identify her calf so you know how old that calf is so you can make some selection decisions based on your, your calf performance. I think another thing is that the, every state has a cattlemen association and they sell a little, little, little like a pocket notebook. You can put in your trade pocket and it has a place to put in the definition of the cow, what calf she had, when it was born. And that's something you can carry in your pocket when you're walking around Chicken cows, you could be out there in the garden somewhere, but it's something that carries you real neatly. So computerized is kind of high class. So then we just want to write it down somewhere in some organized fashion. But the Cattlemen Association and uh, we call it BCIA, Beef Cattle Improvement Associations, they sell these real economic notebook. It's very small. You can keep in your truck, in your car, in your pocket. Then you can start to write things. You see a cow born a certain day, you write it down. Something died for some reason, you write it down. At the end of the year, when you're making plans on what to sell and what to keep, you go pull that book back out. So it's, it's a little more organized than say a sheet of paper. All right. And also, uh, Ronnie West, are you on? Because Ronnie West is kind of handling our cattle, cattlemen association drive. And uh, it's really important for us to join these organizations. It's imperative that we get involved with these offices, uh, with the FSA and the NRCS, but we've got to go through the step of going through the FSA office first. And I've been trying to kind of hand walk our cattlemen um, into those areas. And I think we've got most of them covered. But um, as Handy stated earlier, um, my number is available. And if you got any questions, I'd be more than uh, happy to answer. And if I can't, then I'll point you in the direction where I can get an answer. All right, thank you, Rodney. Another thing about when we're trying to get ourselves working together on things, because the Academy Association, they, they give us free record books that you can get. We talked about those records. Uh, they give them out free for members. We also, and I think we're trying to work out a way to get uh, beef quality, what they call BQA? BQ, yes, yeah. right. Yeah. So when we organize in a group, you know, there's some things we can get cheaper than if you did it by yourself. So they may not come out and, and, and do a B certification to me as a person. But if I tell them I got 25 farmers, all members of the Cattlemen Association, they're going to jump up there real fast. Or they're going to tell you to come to the, to the state Cattlemen Association annual event. So then we can make it to that event. And when you have a big enough population, they will come to your events. So we can get somebody like Handy and Rodney to, to speak as one voice, as a group. We get attention like that. Not, not talking about yourself, 50 or 100 cows. When they're talking about 25 folks and we got 
hundreds of cows, yeah, they give us some attention. So that's our draft going forward. The Cattlemen Association, NRCS. Yeah, FSA, yeah, FSA. FSA. Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of things, because that's how you find out. So then you go into those offices, you don't get what you think you're looking for. You got to talk to somebody like James, he can tell us either there's a way not to say it or is it, or is it a timing event. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You all have a nice evening. All right. All right. All right. Stay safe out there.